Welcome back, everybody, to another week of Sunday School here at the Lighthouse Church of the Nazarene in Moravia, Iowa, where we're going through the book of John. Right now, we're in the middle of John chapter 9, where Jesus heals a man who was born blind from birth. Now, have you ever heard of the name Fanny Crosby? Fanny Crosby was basically born blind. She was blind from six weeks of age and on, so she never knew what it was like to have her sight. But Fanny Crosby went on in her life to write over 8,000 hymns. And there are many of the hymns that we know today were written by Fanny Crosby. Um, Blessed Assurance, To God Be the Glory. In fact, Fanny Crosby wrote so many hymns that she had to start writing them under pseudonyms just so there wouldn't be so many hymns in the hymnal just by one person, Fanny Crosby. But Fanny Crosby was asked if she ever felt like she was slighted by God because she never got to have sight. And you know what she said to that question? She said, I actually rejoice in my blindness because when I die, the first face that I shall ever see when I get to heaven is the face of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That was Fanny's Crosby reaction to basically being born blind. So this man here, he was born blind. Could you imagine never having your sight and then getting your sight. Most of us, we take our sight for granted, do we not? But this guy never knew what it was like to have sight. Jesus opened his eyes and he's like, wow, look at this. So because of this man who was born blind that received his sight from Jesus, there's now a division in the neighborhood. The, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they don't buy it. They're like, what is going on? And some are like, well, this Jesus, he's a good guy. He got this guy to receive his sight. So we're going to pick this up here. Um, let's go in verse 17. I think that's where we left off last week. So we're in John chapter nine, verse 17. Jesus has just healed the man born blind from birth. John chapter nine, verse 17. So they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? Because he has opened your eyes. He said he is a prophet. Verse 18. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, whom you say was born blind? How then does he now see? The Pharisees, they're, they're pretty much acting like this is a conspiracy, like something is going on right here. Verse 20, His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes? We do not know. He is of age. Ask him. He will speak for himself. Now, his parents said he is of age. That gives us a hint into how old this man was who has just received his sight. It means that he was over 13 years of age. That, that's basically all we know about it. He was over 13 years of age because they said he is of age. But that probably makes it so he's not really old because they wouldn't even have to say that. So we don't know how old he is. We know he's at least 13 years of age. Verse 22, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed that he was the Christ, they would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Now, this is interesting right here. The threat of being excommunicated or thrown out of the synagogue, that, that was a big deal at that time. In fact, in a couple more chapters here, it's in John chapter 12, um, where the John tells us that even many of the rulers believed in Jesus, but because of the Pharisees, they didn't confess him, lest they be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So even people believed in Jesus, but they never confessed it because they were afraid of being thrown out of the synagogue. Now, the, the fact is, right here, I think most of us would protect our child and, and even with the threat of excommunication, instead of what these parents did, they, they threw all the attention back on the child because of that. But we find that interesting, do we not? Nowadays, people look for any excuse to leave a church because there's five more on the corner that they can go to. So one little thing wrong, and they're like, ah, oh, we're out of here. Nowadays, anybody will leave a church. Back then, it was a big deal to get excommunicated. In fact, a lot of people nowadays just practice self-excommunication. They just separate themselves from church and worship life, do they not? Verse 24, so they again called the man who was blind and they said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. If you have reference, uh, cross-references in your Bible, I bet this verse right here will cross-reference to Joshua 7, 19. And in Joshua 7, 19, Joshua 
uses the same phrase right here, give God the glory, when he's calling out Achan for his sin. He say, he's telling Achan, give God the glory, tell him how you lie. So this is just basically a way of saying, tell us the truth. That's what it is right here. Verse 25, this is the blind man answering them. He answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Isn't he just gives them their personal, his own personal testimony. He goes, I don't know anything about this man. All I know is that I could never see before and now I can see. But this is the truth right here. Nobody can refute your personal testimony. We are all going to get asked questions that we don't know the answer to. But if, if we say I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. Look what Christ has done in my life. Nobody can argue against that. Nobody can argue your personal testimony. We don't have to know all the answers, but our personal testimony has power. Uh, let's see, verse 26. They said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Now they're starting to get angry. You can just tell. Verse 27, he answered and said, I told you already and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciple? Now, this took some boldness from this young man, I'll say right here, probably in his teens. This took some boldness to ask the Pharisees if they wanted to be a follower of Jesus. Did it not? I think it's great. Uh, verse 28. Then they reviled him and said, you are his disciples. We are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. Verse 30. The man answered and said to them, why, this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Notice that this is not in red letters right here. Notice this is not Jesus talking when it says, verse 31, we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Now this isn't Jesus talking, but, but it is in the Bible. So is it true? Or do we have to take it with a grain of salt because it's a man talking? There, there's different times in the Bible we can see this. When Job's friends talked, some of the things Job's friends said were not correct. In fact, God pointed it out at the end of the book of Job. He said, my wrath is aroused against you because you did not speak what is right. But then if we go to the book of Esther, we find Mordecai telling Esther like, hey, if you don't do what God's asking you to do, deliverance will come from somebody else. God's going to find somebody else. And, and we take that as gospel truth, even though it wasn't God specifically saying it was Mordecai. So this man says, we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Now, if, if God doesn't hear sinners, then, then how, did, how does any of us get saved? The, the prayer that God will always hear is, Lord, have mercy on me as sinners. But the Bible does t say this exact same thing in other parts of the Bible. The Bible does teach that if we have unrepentant sin in our hearts, that, that our prayer life will be hindered. Um, David said it, I believe it's in Psalm 66, 18. Um, David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Uh, the Bible says this in other places. It's Isaiah 115. Um, God says, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear because your hands are full of blood. And uh, it said another time in Isaiah, God says, your iniquities have separated you from God your, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. That's in Isaiah 59. So the Bible does teach if we have unrepentant sin in our hearts, you know, God's not going to hear our prayers. What is, oh, there's another verse. I'm just trying to think of it here real quick. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. All right, uh, let's keep going here. Where are we at? We just went with verse 31. Verse 32. This is still the man talking here. For since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Verse 34, they answered and said to him, you were born completely in sin. And are you teaching us? And they cast him out. Verse 35, now Jesus heard that he had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said, do you believe in the son of God? Now, this is the most important question in the world because the Bible tells us that whoever believes in him has everlasting life. If, if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you believe in the Son of God? That's that's the question we all need to ask ourselves. A Philippian jailer asked Paul, he said, what must I do to be saved? And what did Paul say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So Jesus came up and asked this man, he said, hey, do you believe in the Son of God? Verse 36, he answered and said to them, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Verse 37, Jesus said to him, you have both seen him and it is he who is talking with you. Now, this is this is another case of Jesus clearly saying, I'm the Messiah. He just said it right here. Hey, I am the son of God. I'm the one talking with you is he. He said this to the woman at the well also. The woman at the well back in John chapter four, she said, hey, when the Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. And what did Jesus say? He says, I who speak to you am he. So Jesus says, you know, this man was thrown out of the synagogue. Jesus sought him out. So this man, he was rejected by man, excommunicated from the temple, but he was accepted by God. And, and if Jesus accepts us, it, it does not matter who else rejects us. What did Jesus say? Uh, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Fear Instead, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. All right. So I'm going to go to verse 37. Jesus said to him, you have both seen him and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said to him, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. This, this is very important right here. What did the man do? He worshiped Jesus. Did Jesus say, oh no, don't worship me. No, Jesus fully accepted people worshiping him. We see it right here um, in Matthew chapter 14. After Peter walks on the water for a little bit, and then Jesus calms the storm. It's, it says, uh, who is this? That even the wind and the waves obey him. And it says that they came and they worshiped him. Jesus never told people to not worship him. Um, after he's raised from the dead and Thomas comes up to him and sees his hands and his side, Thomas says to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus didn't correct him or anything. Jesus fully accepted worship. Why is that important? That means he is God. Because there's other times in the Bible when people try to worship something other than God and they get corrected. Um, when Peter was coming to Cornelius, I believe it's in Acts 10 or 11. When Peter was going to see Cornelius, Cornelius came and bowed down before him and worshiped him. And Peter says, no, get up. I'm a man also. Do not do that. And uh, when Paul and Barnabas, when they go to Lystra and uh, the people start to and they heal a person, the people start to say, oh, the voice of a God. And, and Paul and Barnabas have to say, no, no, we are men just like you. And then if you go to Revelation, it's in, it's in Revelation 19.10 and then also in Revelation 22.9. I hope you're following this. The John bows down and worships before an angel. And do you know what the angel says? Do not do that. Get up. Worship God alone. So the fact that Jesus allowed others to worship him is just another way that we know that Jesus is God. And it's it's really cool, I think. So verse 38, then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world that those who do not see may see and that those who see may be made blind. Now, there were some Pharisees who were with him who heard these words and they said to him, are we blind also? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. Now, this is actually a very difficult saying. What, what is Jesus saying right here? If you were blind, you would have no sin. I think what Jesus is telling these Pharisees is that there's actually no hope for you because you think you are fine. You don't realize that, that you are lost. But if you realize you're lost, if you realize you're blind, then there's hope for you. But but people that think that they're just fine and that they don't need Jesus, that they are the lost ones. I think that's what Jesus is saying right here. All right, we're done for this week. One last thing we can say about this blind man here. We are all like this blind man, are we not? We are all born spiritually blind. Jesus seeks us out just like this guy did. We obey Jesus and we are changed. We were once blind, but now we see. We, we have been changed. We have been born again. So we're done with John chapter nine. We'll be in John chapter 10 next week. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something and I'll see you the same time, same place next week. Bye.